The Dice Tower is made possible by listeners like you. Thank you for your support. And by Cool Stuff, Inc. Cool Stuff, in stock at CoolStuffInc.com. The Dice Tower, episode 540. The best of 2003, 15 years ago. Welcome to the Dice Tower, a podcast about board games and card games, and especially the people who play them. On today's show, Jeff takes a look at the future of balance. We look forward to the conventions of 2018. We answer some questions from the mailbag, including wondering why we insist on calling Essen, Essen. We present a Tales of Horror showdown, and we finish up by going all the way back to 2003 with our top ten list. I'm Eric Summerer. And here's your host, the Captain Jack Sparrow of board gaming, Tom Vassell. <sighs> All right, fine. Um, no one likes Captain Jack Sparrow, though. Yeah, well, he... I mean, the moviegoers like him, but yeah. in his timeline, no one likes him. But, yes, he's not a well-liked character. <sighs> I'd rather be Will Turner, man. Okay, but fine. Sure. Um, so it came out 15 years ago. Like, this is, like, like each year I'm like, what? That movie's 15 years old yeah, now? Yeah, that's a little crazy. Actually, it's a little crazy just going through this. So, folks, each year we go back 5, 10, and 15 years ago. We'll get back to craziness next week of other – I mean, next podcast of other top tens. But we – you know, I like doing these retrospectives. I think they're good for the us, and I think they're good to take a look back because the Dice Tower is often accused of being cult of the new. Right. And it's good to take a look back. And I found some uh, – you know, we get a lot of complaints about these episodes. I don't care about these games. <laughs> well, maybe you should – like – it's good for you, like even from an educational purpose. Really? From a historical standpoint, where are the, what are the games that made where we're at today? Right. And, and which ones are still relevant after 10, 15 years? That's pretty cool too. And oddly enough, 15 years ago, Eric and I were just getting into the hobby. Yes, yeah, these are the first couple of years. I was just patiently waiting for somebody to start the Dice Tower. Yeah, well, we got around to it. Well, I actually was writing reviews in 2003. Mm -hmm. My first review was in 2002, but that's kind of... I just wrote a couple then. 2003 is when I really started writing reviews, and it's deliberately because a few of the games are my top ten later on. Hmm. So 15 years of doing reviews, and it's really hard for me to imagine... What has transpired over 15 years? Because it was never a plan. Yeah. Now, I just, I just did a rant the other day on my Q&A about how I never imagined – people always say I never imagined when they really did. Like someone wins American Idol and they'll be like, I never imagined – or they'll say it's beyond my wildest dreams. No, that's garbage. This is literally your, your wildest, wildest dream, dream right here. was to win that thing. <laughs> yeah, okay. And my wildest dreams are like amazing. I win like five hundred forty million dollars in some, you know, settlement from Bill Gates and and uh, and you know, uh, whatever you know. So, yeah, I dreamed of having a, a dice tower, but it wasn't kind of like this, right? Yeah, it was you know me in like the center of America in a tower somewhere, <laughs> you know, like uh, <laughs> you know with radio equipment everywhere and all my best friends. I'm working with them, which kind of is true, you know, but it's except we're in, in Homestead. Uh, but yeah, I dreamed of this to some degree, but I never looked at it as even a realistic possibility. I just wrote reviews because they were fun. Yeah. And, uh, then as time went by, I, I, I still, I mean, we now it's my job, but it's still fun every Monday. I think, oh, okay, it's time to go to work. And then I think, I remember when I used to dread going into work on Mondays and I never do now. Cool. That's good. I mean, there's some days that I'm like, I'm glad when they're over. And, you know, there's days like today where I come home and I'm like, oh, yeah, we got to record. We got to record with Eric. Oh, man. But that's okay because I squeezed in that darn cat. We watched that with uh, my family. And that movie's 20 years old. I, I, I don't know what to talk about. Wow. We watched the new one. I know the old one's better, people, whatever. I like the new one. Um, and. Oh, man, everything is just – time flies by. And I say all this because our Kickstarter is almost over. Like when you hear this, it, it's going to be over in a few days. Okay. So if you want to uh, get in on it, 
and you were just like, um, I wonder, wonder no longer, you know, <laughs> go, go and back us so that we can continue on. Besides, me and Eric want to do that game show. Yeah. And that's one of the stretch goals. That would be fun. But we did hit the second gaming marathon, and Eric is going to do his best to be at that one. I really want to. I, I missed out on the on the uh, the, the most recent one. You guys did sounded you like watch you were having a lot of fun. I I checked in on on social media and and you know saw little bits and pieces, but not not much Tears of it. Unfortunately, rolled down his cheeks. Yeah. Well, all that being said, we should mention this to our listening audience. You, some people who are listening to the show, say. Man, Tom and Eric are taking the days off now. They're only doing the show every other time. You know, they got Mandy and Suzanne on, and they're being lazy. We are not good listeners. We do a our, this. Uh, well, I won't say the same show because it's definitely morphed. But we do a video show every other week. So when you hear this, it's the opposite week. Uh, so if you're listening to this on the Tuesday, release it. It will be next Wednesday night. Right. It's called Dice Tower tonight on the video show. It's live. It's interesting. I think uh, we play some games. You can be involved and ask questions and all sorts of things. So you And if you can't watch that, then check out DiceTowerAudio.com. DiceTowerAudio.com is where we upload a lot of our videos, just the audio version, so you can listen to them. I try to pick things to put on that feed that I think would be interesting to listen to. Now, I realize, though, Dice Tower Tonight is about 20% visual. <laughs> yes. Yeah. One of the, the cool parts about it is that we get to show things. Here, look at this. So, yeah, you are listening to the audio of a video show. But still, if, if you'd like to hear more of us, that's one way to do it. Well, with that being said, we're going to jump in and talk about some games. I'm afraid Eric has to go first. Aha! Cute. Uh, so what? I got to play uh, another one of the Fast Forward series games. These are from Freedom and Freeze and Stronghold Games. Uh, this is Fear. And if I recall correctly, Tom, you called this your favorite of the three, correct? It's my favorite, but I could easily switch and say Fortress is my favorite. I like the I like them almost the same. Okay. Uh, I don't want to get too far into details here uh, because part of the fun of the fast-forward games is exploring the deck. You you don't have an instruction book. You simply start flipping up cards, and, and it, the game explains itself to you. And the, the game morphs as you go and work your way through the deck. Uh, Fear is sort of a... Not really a trick-taking game. It's it's one of those where you are playing cards into the center. The cards, most of them have numbers on them. And... Uh, you are playing them into the center of the board, and you are trying to avoid going over a value of 15. You can either draw a card or play a card on your turn, and uh, you have a hand limit of three. So once you have three cards in your hand, you have to play. And once you play a card, you then, at the end of your turn, declare what the total is in the center of the table. And if that total is higher than 15, you have lost. And whoever has the most value in their hand, in numerical value, wins that round. Whoever lost, those cards go out of the game, and if you play another round, you then have new cards that you're going to slowly work your way through the deck. Eventually, you start to get new rules that show up that sort of morph, change the rules, tweak things a little bit, uh, and, uh, and, and make the game you know, interesting and, and, and different as you move along. Uh, I the only other one of these actually no I have played I've played maybe half the way through Fortress, and I recently played all the way through Flea, uh, and we played all the way through the deck on Fear as well, just because we sort of thought there'd be an ending. Uh, there there is one in Flea, there is not really in Fear. There's just more rules. Eventually you get through all of the rules and you have them all available and it pretty much tells you to reshuffle the deck and keep going. So we had been keeping score, you know, how many times did you win? How many times did you win thinking there'd be some sort of ultimate winner? There's not. It's just more rules. Uh, it Actually, is... I don't dislike that because it changes into a game that you can play. Like, now that I've gone through that deck, mm. I may not go through it again, but I can grab some people who've already played it, and we can just play it as a regular game. You very much could. Uh, and But then you have to evaluate it against other similar games, like maybe Too Many Cooks, uh, an older card game. that it, This feels a lot like that. Um, it's very it's also light. Print. you got to take that into effect. Okay, into that's account. true. That's true. It, it was it was fun. I liked the the tactics. Sometimes you're faced with situations though where you simply can't do anything about your situation. Uh, you have to just play cards that are um, that are not that are going to lose the game for you. Um, rounds can go very quickly based on the rules that are out at any given moment. 
It's it's silly, quick fun, and I I enjoyed the system. I was just a little disappointed that there wasn't there wasn't a finale to it. It's it's just here's a fun game to play. Um, go for it, and now you've got a, a nice one deck, um, you know, quick game. I think I think you're getting spoiled by legacy games. Maybe. Well, and and also the fact that Flea had a plot, it had an arc. Um, so. I, if yeah, I had to man, rank these, I did these, not like Flea at all, though. So I know. I, did you actually? Did you get all the way through it, or did you? Um, no, because I got tired of it. It was the same thing over and over and over again. Yeah. Um, I did okay, but I walked through the whole deck. I walked through it to see what I was going to run into and find out. Okay, because I wanted to make sure that you know. And and I yes, I know there was some interesting and funny surprises and stuff. Right. But it was just a big puzzle all the time, and I didn't find it interesting. Okay. Well, if I had to rank them, I would I would unfortunately put Fear at the bottom, Fortress in the middle, and Flea on top. But I haven't gone all the way through Fortress. That could still shift a little bit. But that's where I am with the Fast Forward series and Fear. All right. Well, I guess I'm going to go with a slightly larger game called Lords of Hellas. <laughs> Lords, Lords of Hellas is a... I guess the best way to describe it is dudes on a map game. It's very similar to games like if you like Kemet or things like that. This was a Kickstarter last year. It's actually made by the same people who made this War of Mine, although I can't think of any games very, you know, as different. This War of Mine was like, hey, war is bad. Lords of Hellas is like, um, no, war is pretty cool. So <laughs> in this <laughs> game, the mythology of this game is Greek mythology in the future. What? Because. Well, it's kind of like I, I, Hercules is running around, and Perseus has a jetpack, and Hercules has some futuristic armor. It's like ancient <laughs> Greece, but everyone's look looks futuristic. No jetpack. Well, I mean that's how he's fast. Anyhow, yeah, it's it's actually I think it's a pretty cool look. You know, it's basically Greek mythology, but they made them all look futuristic. So in this game, you are trying to win through. Uh, there's four different victory conditions. There's these gigantic monsters. Like, you have these little dudes in the map, like Access and Ally size running around. And then you have monsters that are, like, twice as big as the Blood Rage miniatures. Whoa. So they're, like, walking around the map. <laughs> and so if you slay three of those monsters, you win. Hmm. If there, then there's, like, an area control thing on the board. If you control two, two lands, big groups of uh, it's the same color things, you control those, you win. There is... Um, Temples, there's, I think, like 11 or 12 temples scattered around. If you control five temples, you win. And then there's these gigantic monuments. I mean, huge. They're as big as your microphone, Eric. Oh? Um, and you slowly build these monuments over the course of the game. And then if one of them's finished, you can uh, – if you control that monument for three turns, you win. So there's these four different ways, kind of area control, but there's also these monsters. And on your turn, you have different actions you can take, and you're moving your hero around – and you're also moving hoplites around your regular soldiers, and they fight each other with card combat. And if you want to, your hero can go off on quests, but he can also go and fight these giant monsters, which are really hard to kill, but they're not unkillable. I just played it today and killed two of them hmm. and was eyeing a third one when someone else won the game a different way. And it's like 90 minutes to two hours. The miniatures are – I would say they are an A – I'm, I'm very hesitant because I'm not, like, the best miniatures guy. I look at them and I'm like, whoa! And then, like, Vernon and Sam will go, well, they're pretty good. <laughs> I'm like, oh, I'm sorry I liked them. I didn't know I wasn't supposed to. <laughs> you know, that sort of thing, right? <laughs> um, but it's it's just – it's a really neat game. There's a gazillion, you know, gobs of other content for the game beyond the base game. But I don't – you know, the base game itself is fine. It's really good. If you like Kemet and that style of game, you will like this one a lot. So, Eric, I'm not recommending it for you. But okay, I think a lot of people will like Lords of Hellas. Cool. Next for me is the more recent Buffy the Vampire Slayer game. This is not the Hasbro year 2000 one. This is from Jasco Games, I think from last year. Was it 2017? It may have been late 2016 that this came out. Were well, um, well, well, we talking about the upper deck thing? No, no, this is, this is the, uh, actually, so this one is in the middle. Uh, this is the Jasco one. Um, this is a cooperative game from Thomas M. Gofton. Uh, it's Buffy the Vampire okay. Slayer, the board game. I know game. which one you're talking about now. Okay. Uh, this is, it's a co-op. Uh, you each take one of the roles, classic Buffy uh, design. You, you could be Giles, you can be Buffy, you can be uh, Willow, etc. 
Each player gets four actions, three like standard actions, move, uh, fight, um, and then you also get a a special action based on your your special uh, power. Um, so Buffy, you know, is good at staking things and and can stun all the baddies in her zone when she uses her special action. However, every time you use a special action, you're going to reveal a nasty event card. So that's sort of the the balancing action for doing something cool. Something bad's going to happen. Plus. You have to activate all four of your action tokens before you can reset them. So at some point, you're going to have to use your special power and reveal a nasty event card. Uh, You are moving around this map, different locations of Sunnydale, and uh, you are trying to protect townies. There are little townspeople figurines, not figurines, tokens, uh, that you are trying to protect from vampires and monsters, demons. And uh, if too many of these bystanders die, you lose. In fact, this is also the scoring system of the game. If you save, you know, if you only lose six of them, you have a slayer level, you know, reward or you, you've, you've reached that point in the game. But if you lose more of them, then you, you have a different ranking at the end. Ultimately, you are trying to knock out three baddies of the week, uh, monsters of the week. Uh, which then lead up to the big bad, which is one of the classic uh, big villains from various seasons of the TV show. So the master or glory and stuff like that. Uh huh. I know. Um, all of them. Yes. Uh, the 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 battle system. There are no dice here. This is this is um, almost all deterministic. Uh, either you instantly hurt somebody or stake somebody. Or you draw from uh, the event deck, and it's got these uh, like glyph symbols on them. There's three different. Glyphs, uh, so the the chances are either uh, one-third, one out of three of doing something, or maybe two out of three if they give you two different glyphs that are a success. And that's how you eventually win against these big bads, uh, by, by hoping to draw the right glyph. Um, that can be a little nasty if you don't get a good draw on a, you know, two out of three or something like that, because often you have, to, you have to, it's one of these where you have to circle back and, and re vamp replenish your supplies before you go after somebody again and that can be a little annoying but i did like the uh the, the act of of trying to manage the townies manage the vamps manage the demons while still trying to search for clues and the monster of the week and and figure out the plot of the overarching uh you know story of of this particular game there's a lot of different big bads there's a lot of monsters of the week uh, a lot of variety in here it really feels like the tv show um if you're going to compare it to the 2000 board game which i still have a nostalgic feel for this is a far better game um and, and it i think it's well structured it, it's it's pretty good my only complaint really is that possible uh you know luck of the draw can be if it goes really poorly your way, it can be very frustrating and really extends the game. But overall, I'm pretty happy with the Jasco Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Okay, um, hang on. Hang on, Eric. I need to talk to the audience for a second. Yeah. If you fell asleep because you're not a fan of Buffy, wake up. We're back. <laughs> All right. <laughs> no, look. Okay, look. Buffy is a, a show that a lot of people loved, and I'm, and I'm glad for them. I do not mean to say anything bad about them. It, it's a fine show, but for goodness sake, how many games do we need on this same subject over and over again? Shut up about Star Wars. At least okay. two more. <laughs> well, have you played the Upper Deck one yet? I have not. I, was, I, I wasn't able to get it What it released this past Gen Con, right? Uh, I, it sold out at Gen Con. I didn't get a chance to get it, uh, and I, I just haven't had a chance to play it yet. So you're probably annoyed that it's just sitting on my shelf then. Yes. We should bring that as one of the six for the next Dice Tower tonight, so it eventually comes to me. I'm not going to. Gonna, no, you don't, you don't get like a <laughs> – you don't get to like seed this with games that you won. <laughs> That's not how that works. It's not? Come on. Uh, all right, all right, all right. I'm going to talk about a really interesting game called The Sanctuary. So the, the, the theme of The Sanctuary is you have been given several hect, – hect, uh, I, I, I need to learn how to pronounce words. Hect, hect acres. Is it hectares? Hectares. Hectares. Yep. Oh, fine. Okay. So you've been given several hectares, like 100 or so hectares of land. And you are going to build a wildlife sanctuary hmm. so that your that animals can come and live in your sanctuary. So that's pretty cool, right? Um, it's a cool theme. The box looks really cool. 
But okay, that's about the extent of the theme. Now you were just, you know, playing some sort of points game. I mean, not necessarily. You you have the sanctuary and you have four different animals that are going to come to your sanctuary and you're going to get points for them. And you do so by a really unique worker placement um, method. You place two workers out and there's a whole really long row of cards. In fact, you bend it around the table a little bit so it fits in the middle of the table. And each of these cards is separated into a top and a bottom. And when you place a worker, you place it on the top of a card. And once everyone's placed all their workers, you take the action of the top of the card and all the bottoms of the cards that you can see. But what by see means you keep going along until you run into a card that someone else's meeple's on. So if no one puts their meeple near you, you'll be taking a ton of actions. Hmm. Or sometimes there's an action you really want to take, but if you put it there, you're only going to get one or, one or two uh, actions on the bottom. Hmm. So that's kind of a cool concept. Now, the, the game itself is about getting animals to come into your thing, uh, getting sen- scenery for your park, you know, upgrading animals, getting the cubes you need to make the animals to get points, you know, supplies for the animals. It's kind of like a points out Feldian style game. But it works. I really like it. And it's not that long. I was very hmm. pleased with ni- like 90 minutes. But it feels like a very fulfilling game. Now, lest people get excited about this one, I haven't a clue how it's being published in America. This is a game from Poland, I believe. Let's see. I'm going to look up the sanctuary here and see who the publisher is since I didn't write it on a thing like Eric usually does. (laughs) I couldn't spell sanctuary there for a while. All right. Wow, there's actually – okay. Technically, the whole name is the Sanctuary Endangered Species. Ah. And it's from – Cube Factory of Ideas. It's a Polish company. The designer is um, a Polish name, which I d- daren't pronounce. <laughs> um, so I, I got it at Essen. It looked really cool. And I think it's, it feels different as a worker placement game. And the theme, while not necessary, is pretty solid. Very, very happy with this one. Highly recommend it. And I'm going to see and make sure that some U.S. publisher picks it up. The Sanctuary Endangered Species. Hmm. So it's kind of like the board game version of We Bought a Zoo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, uh, kind of. I mean, you are actually building the sanctuary, then filling it with animals. And We Bought a Zoo, I think they, they, the zoo was already there, right? They just bought it. All right, fine. It's, it's nothing like We Bought a Zoo. Well, I mean, if you want to pretend that Matt Damon is in your game... Was he in We Bought a Zoo? Yes. I think he was. Yes. Okay. I don't care. I'm going to – when I do play it, I will name my main character Matt Damon. <laughs> Not the character that was in the movie. Right. No, just Matt, Matt Damon. Damon. <laughs> <laughs> I don't care what he's right, called fine. in the movie. All right. Uh, my last game to talk about is Catan VR. Uh, I had a chance to, to get my hands on this at – PAX Unplugged uh, at oh, the end of last video year. footage of this. Somewhere. Yes, uh, Jason did a, a vlog of this and also an interview with the, the developers. The developers are um, Experiment 7 along with Asmodee Digital. And uh, this is, like they say, a virtual reality version of Catan. And when I first heard about this, I... I was pretty scornful. I was like, this is ridiculous. Who wants to, like, stand in the middle of a Catan board and, well, like, what, you pretend to be a villager? What's up with that? Um, I, I sort of missed the, the concept. The idea is that they're, they're trying to recreate the ability to be sit ar- sitting around a table with your friends playing Catan, uh, but through vast distances so that, uh, you know, you can re- Keep a game group together even if you've moved away or, or somebody's gone to college or, or, you know, elsewhere. Halfway across the world, you can sit down around a virtual table and play Catan. And the experience is literally sitting around a table playing Catan. They've made this, like, wooden longhouse uh, that you can turn and look out the window and see a vista that is based on the box of Catan with the mountain and the sunset and the birds flying by and the sheep walking around. You can stand up and look around and see that whole thing out the window. Of course, you have a game to play, so you need to sit back down. Uh, This thing runs on uh, many of the popular virtual reality systems like the Oculus Rift. They're they're going for some of the... um, like the phone-based systems that make it a little more affordable to play this sort of thing. Uh, You've got 
these panels that you can put anywhere in your virtual space. You can look at the expressions of your opponents as you try and trade with them. Uh, you're, you're literally looking around this room and then look down at the board. It's an animated board. You can bend down, get close, and see birds flying around. It's, it is a breathtaking experience. And I haven't experienced a lot of virtual reality stuff, but it's the smoothest VR I've ever seen. That said... I think the the audience for this is still pretty narrow. Like one, you have to have a virtual reality virtual reality system in order to play it. Um, I don't, uh, and and you need to be in this this mindset of I want to play a game with my friends over these fast distances that I can't do, you know, through Skype basically. It it mm. it creates a, it's a gorgeous presentation. I think for what they're trying to do. And and I I guess I'm I'm happier with what they're trying to do than I was of thinking I was just going to be a farmer in the land of Catan. Uh, they they did it very well and and it, it looks lovely and it it plays well and there's animations as you get resources and and you can see the expressions of your opponents. It it's neat. I just don't know if it's something I need. Still, if you're interested, I think they've been doing a, a beta and the uh, the game should be out soon. Catan VR. I know that you think it's neat, but I'm not sold on it. I'm just not. I I, I don't know why. Um, but then again, every time I say this, I remember thinking how stupid the idea of playing a game on an iPad sounded. <laughs> yeah, it's true. I think early on we were making fun of that sort of thing. What, I need a phone to play this game? What, everybody needs an iPhone to play this game? <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah, there may, there's no proof I ever said such things. Don't listen to old podcasts. Uh huh. So I, I'm gonna be like, I'm cautious not to say that sounds dumb, even <laughs> if I'm thinking it. Well, I don't know though. I mean, will VR work? I I, I played a VR video game. It was really fun, but hmm. it didn't make me say I will never want to play anything else either. But like you said, it's for long distances. But then the people you're playing with are they gonna look realistic? I don't know what they look like. They're they're like weird. They're they're paintings. Um, they the the avatars weren't fully finished when I saw them, uh, but, so they were cartoony avatars that we were seeing. Uh, but they have a freaky, expressions. Though? They you can see where they were looking. You know, you'd like you could see them looking back and forth and looking down at the board, and it, it felt like you were interacting with a character at least. And not just, you know, somebody's screen name, which is what you feel like when you're playing, uh, you know, Tabletopia or, um, you know, one of the online systems. All right. All right. Well, let me quickly talk about a small game called Shaky Manor. This is from Blue Orange Games. Have you seen this one, Eric? I have. I almost bought this at Essen. This looked fun. Well, I think that it will be eventually available in the U.S. I don't believe it is so far. Which seems to be the uh, theme of my games today. Sorry about that, folks. But it will come. So just like a heads up. This is yeah. just a really silly little game. You have this box that you'll have. And it's up to four players. Although I suppose you could buy two copies of the game and then play up to eight. Whatever. Um, hmm. And in this box, you have a. It has it's split into four rooms. And each room has a little doors. And then you just have a bunch of pieces you're shaking around. There's three gold cubes. Those are treasure chests. An archaeologist. A little meeple dude. Uh, two snakes. Uh, two eyeballs that roll around, two ghosts, and that might be everything. I think there might be something else that I'm forgetting. And then you flip a card over, and you need to get the archaeologist and the three gold chests into the room shown on the card. So you just shake it around and do that, which is really hard, especially with those eyeballs, because they roll everywhere. Or you could play a slightly advanced variant of the game where you flip a card, two cards over, and one card shows the objects, and the other card shows a room, and you need to get everything into that room. That's hmm. even harder because the snakes get caught on everything <laughs> and the eyeballs are still rolling around. Mm -hmm. That's the game. If that sounds interesting, you'll like Shaky Manor. If it doesn't, you won't. You know, it's, <laughs> it's, it fits in the blue orange who's gone from a company that I was like, eh, they're pretty cool back in the day to now. I'm like, wow, you have, if you have kids' games, blue orange is one of the ones I would mention. And Shaky Manor is one of those when it comes out in America. You definitely want to get a copy for your kids. Yeah. Okay. And that's games. Let's move on to someone smarter than Eric and I put together Squared. Three, two, one, go. 
It's time for Game Tech with Jeff Engelstein, where we find out how games really work. For the last few Game Techs, I've been talking about what happens when you have a magic box that can be fed the rules to a game, and in 24 hours it can play it hundreds of thousands of times and learn it better than any human player. I think we're not all that far from that, actually. Ten years tops, I would say. And I want to take one last trip into this particular rabbit hole. Now, as designers and players, one of the things that we want from games is balance. We want to know, for the most part, that when we sit down to play a game, that you're not starting behind the eight ball because of the turn order or the faction that you've been assigned. Now, obviously, most of the time, balance can't be perfect, but it should be close. And that's one of the things the Magic Box can tell us. My latest game, The Expanse, has four different factions with varying starting positions and different abilities. I could give the rules to the magic box, have it develop the best strategies for each faction, and then tell me what fraction of games each faction wins. I could then try tweaking some abilities, plug it back in, and come back a day later to see if I'm on the right track or not. Then, when the game releases, and everyone says the UN is overpowered and wins way too much, I can triumphantly post my data and prove to all the whiners out there that the game is really balanced. End of argument, right? Well, of course not. First, arguments over the internet never end, so there's that. But more importantly, real live humans aren't playing my game hundreds of thousands of times. They're playing it one, two, maybe three times if I'm lucky. And over those first few plays, it is very possible that the game is imbalanced. Or, to phrase it differently, that it feels unbalanced to the players. Now, when game designers get together, we talk about a lot of stuff, and one of the popular topics lately has been a concept of actual balance versus perceived balance. In other words, it doesn't really matter if a game is balanced or not. It matters if it feels balanced to the players or not. If the players think it's balanced, it's balanced. It may sound tautological, but it's actually a fairly subtle concept. Now, going back to the Expanse for a second, I do hear frequently that the UN faction is overpowered. Now, I really don't think it is. I've played the game a ton of times and kept stats and haven't seen the UN win more often than the other factions. And most of the people saying that that have played the game once or twice, so I trust my stats over them. But looking at the game with a fresh set of eyes, I think I understand why that thought is out there. Now, one of the UN faction's key special abilities is that they break ties when determining who controls an area. That's a passive ability. People don't need to make any choices about it. It's just always on and does what it does. The OPA faction, in contrast, has a special action that it can do. Now, they can more easily place influence into certain parts of the map, but it's active. You have to choose to do that, and you have to choose to do that instead of something else. And so there's a judgment there. What's the value of taking my special action instead of just doing a normal action? And it's hard to judge that value. It's part of the skill of the game. And when you develop that skill, that special ability can be incredibly powerful, but you need to know when it's powerful and when you should be doing something else. So the UN is low skill and the OPA is high skill. And once players are equally high skilled, the factions are balanced, but When players are just starting out, they may not be. So as a designer, I've failed my players in a way. And interestingly, this is not a situation that the Magic Box will help me with. Because of the way it learns from nothing, playing randomly at first and building up knowledge, it would be difficult to get a snapshot within those hundreds of thousands of games and say, this knowledge base of the Magic Box right now, this is comparable to the knowledge that a new player has. This is what is representative of those first few plays. Now, there are a few strategies to deal with this type of perceived imbalance. One is to try to design it out. Watch playtesters carefully in terms of the options they choose, particularly with players new to your game. But it can be interesting as a designer and a player to have factions that are more challenging or subtle to play. The trading game Sidereal Confluence comes with nine different factions, but it takes a strategy of ranking them for difficulty, which is a smart way to address this. It also makes specific recommendations about which faction should be included in your first game and the play style of each, so you know what you're getting into. Another option is to put mini strategy guides into your rules that try to show players what looks like a weaker option can actually be really effective. It's usually something like, quote, warning, players who ignore X may find themselves falling behind, or option Y may seem weak at first, but used correctly, it can be very powerful. 
Just acknowledging the perception and planting a seed into the players' heads can often be enough to overcome perceived balance issues. Now, competitive video games like League of Legends face an almost intractable version of perceived versus actual balance. Players can select between over 100 different champions to play during the game, and they can have widely varying abilities. And the strength of many champions is highly dependent on the skill of the player. Low skill players may find a particular champion very weak, but it might be incredibly powerful in the hands of a pro player. So as a League of Legends designer, who do you balance for? Certain champions may be totally dominating play at one skill level and ignored at another. Do you want to balance for the pros or for the bulk of your player base? It's a challenging question without a good answer. The reality is that the balance of a game is going to shift as players move through different skill levels. And except for the simplest games, you can't make it balance at all points along that continuum. As players become more skilled, they're going to be able to more effectively use the tools the game hands them. And increasing your mastery of a game system is a big part of what makes games fun for many of us. It certainly is for me. But as a designer, if people think your game is unbalanced on their first play, they're not going to play it again to start to learn how to deal with that. The game needs to be reasonably well balanced in the perception of the typical first-time player. As a designer, you can argue all you want that after you get really good at a game, it's balanced. But if players won't come back because of a negative first experience, it doesn't make a difference. Perception is reality in this case. This is Jeff Engelstein with Game Tech. So Jeff brings up an interesting point. You know, do you do you balance your game for the the newbies, somebody that's only played the game like twice? Or, or do you go for the long-term balance? You know, there, there's all sorts of games that have been tweaked months down the line or, or in a second edition because once people have played the game extensively, you know, those, some of those imbalances show up later even though they may have tweaked the game for initial balance at first. Yes. <laughs> I, I do it perfectly in all directions. Uh. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. That's a hard thing. <laughs> hard call. I think you do have to go for that initial impression. I think that's more important, at least at first. And then you may be able to tweak things in a second edition. And by then, you're popular enough that people sort of know to, you know, that, that certain factions are going to be trickier to play than others. Mm-hmm. All right. All right. Well, let's talk briefly. I, I had no segue there, Eric. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm slipping. It was just some, some grunting. That, that works. When in doubt, just <laughs> grunt. Is not a good yeah. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Mm. 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 Well, that's what Jeff's brain does to me. <laughs> okay, so people have been asking what conventions we're going to go to. So I did a video on this, but we're going to do a quick rundown. I'm going to be in Miami, Ohio at the end of February for Miami University Recon. Mm. So me, Sam, and Z will be there if you want to stop by and say hi. And then the following month, we'll be going to the Gamma Trade Show. Briefly, we're not going to be doing our big streaming setup that we've done in the past. Instead, we're going to take some videos and send them out to you all of just different things that we see, some hot games and things like that. And then after, directly after that, we're going straight to MeepleCon. So we hope to see many of you in Las Vegas. And we'll be doing Wits and Wagers so that me, Sam, and Z, and Derek will be at that one. Hmm. Uh, the month after that is April. April, yes. April. Well, no major conventions there, but while we're at the Gathering of Friends, we will probably make a day trip to Canada. So if you're in the Toronto area, keep an eye on our Twitter feed. I'll announce when we're going to show up there and play games. And then in May, CMONCON, where we're going to go to CMONCON and hang out and play some games and check out the latest stuff from them. And then in June, Eric is finally going to a convention. Yeah, <laughs> although I think you're going to one before that, right? Like a uh, smaller one in your area. Yes, I'll be going to ConCon in March. Uh, it's it's ConCon's thirtieth a year, so that's that'll be a fun fun time. That's like older than you. No, not really. We're old. <laughs> Um, anyhow, uh, so then in June, we're doing Origins, and Origins are – the current plan is to do every what we've done every year, the big streaming setup there. And then in July is Dice Tower Cons. So excited about that. If you want to see Dice – there's still a few tickets left for that, folks, so you want to get – come there. And really, 
that's the show everyone's going to be at, right? If you want to meet people from the Dice Tower, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's the con to go to. I mean, well, technically, then the next month is Gen Con, and most of us will be there too. But your chance of meeting us there and talking to us is much smaller. It's true. Um, but that yes, we're going to Gen Con, and then in September, I'm going to a camp in Poland. Wow. Uh, where with for Geek and Sons, so you can check that out. And that's going to be a super fun week. And it's the same week, Sam and Z are going to Iceland. And Eric's going to be in a unique world in the book he's currently reading that week. <laughs> yes, I'm sure. Yes. You've gone to worlds we've never seen, Eric. You betcha. I was inside a video game like all day today. Oh, well, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, and then in uh, – that was September. October is Essen. Oh, boy. Eric will be there. Yay. And so I and Mandy and Suzanne – um, and so El Mandy and Suzanne will be at several of the other conventions too. I should mention they will be at many of these cons too. And then in November, at the very, very end of November and the beginning of December, we'll be at PAX Unplugged. Mm-hmm. And that's it. The cruise, I just signed the documents for the cruise. Okay, so we're definitely going ago. on the cruise. But that's in February 2019. The actual dates will be released very soon, folks. I'm not kidding. Follow me on Twitter if you want to go on the cruise because we have so many people already signed up. I mean we're down to just a few seats for people who – like once we open it up, there's not many tickets for sale. So if you want to get on that waiting list to get the first shot at them, you need to email me and I'm going to forward it right to Jason. Hmm. I think you could email – maybe you could email Jason directly at DiceTowerCruise at gmail.com. But if you're not sure, email DiceTower at gmail.com. Okay. Okay, so – but ba doop ba ba doop. I man, my transitions are really bad here. Boop a da ba doop a doop. <laughs> so <laughs> let's go to something slightly scarier. And now another tale of board gaming horror. Gather round, children. All right, hang on, Mister Scary Man. What? Um, so, folks, this week I, I, we're we're almost out of tales of horrors, or at least ones that we're going to read on the show. So we have two tales of horrors here, and we're going to have you guys vote on which one is scarier. So listen to both of these stories. I'm sorry, Mister Scary Man, that you have to do double work here, and you'll have to tell us which one's better. Just keep that in mind. Back to you, Mister Scary Man. I've developed an eye twitch. This twitch is typically due to the usual irritants one could expect from an OCD board game owner. Riffle shuffling cards, Cheeto stained fingers, and the particularly irksome habit of bending cards. Now I'd like to think I'm a patient guy, and I can prove it. You see, at a recent board game night, I was thrilled to show off my newly painted custom copy of Blood Rage. I welcomed several new players to my table, explained the rules, and we started playing. One of the players, let's call him Doug, had never played before and was rather slow to complete his turns. While considering where to invade with his minis, Doug had a habit of thoughtfully stroking his large, unkempt beard. However, on second glance... I realized that he was not using his hand to stroke his beard. He was using the mini. My newly painted minis, combing through his greasy, gnarly beard hair. My eye started twitching. Not wanting to be rude, I assured myself this must just be an absent-minded habit, and I made a mental note to disinfect the entire yellow clan after the game. To my chagrin... Doug proceeded to not only comb most of his clan through his face fuzz before invading, but even gave a slight nervous nibble to the lower edge of the frost giant. Twitching uncontrollably. Despite trying to be patient, I had to say something. Um, Doug? Are you hungry or something? To this he replied, No. Totally missing the hint, he casually placed the poor nibbled frost giant on the board after briefly brushing it against his lips. I was still twitching when I got home. I have a custom-painted blood rage set that I'm selling for cheap. (laughs) Or, 
I love my in-laws. I really do. They are quirky, but then again, so am I. After all, I'm sure it's odd to them that I have an entire room in my home that is dedicated to board games. They visit every holiday season, to include this year. Every holiday visit, they kindly express interest in the board games and are more than happy to play games in the evenings. While I'm delighted to teach and play games with them, there's a problem. My father-in-law is a card licker. What does that mean? Well, it's quite simple. Every page he turns in a book, every card he selects from his hand, every sticky note he picks up, he habitually and likely unconsciously first gives a big old sloppy lick to his fingers. While I'm not sure it actually provides extra traction to his grip, I can assure you that it raises my blood pressure. Three years ago, he licked his way through my cherished copy of No Thanks. After playing, I gifted this appropriately named game to him for Christmas. Two years ago, I thought I was clever when I sleeved Colorado before playing with him. Despite my efforts, I just couldn't get past the now sticky sleeves that were tarnished with a hint of coffee breath and spit smudges. Once again, I gifted him my copy after playing. This year, I really thought I was smart. I planned a game that had no cards in it, nothing for him to lick. With a proud, self-impressed smile, I sat down to teach my wife and in-laws photosynthesis. A clever little game with no cards, no paper, just beautiful little trees and seed tokens. On the first round of the game, my father-in-law, who was playing the blue pine trees, announced that he would be planting a seed. In what seemed like slow motion to me, I watched in horror as he eyed his supply of cardboard seed tokens, gave his index finger an especially sloppy lick, and smooshed his now soggy finger on the poor little token. Given that it's become somewhat a tradition, I almost just gave him the game afterwards. Instead, I think I'll just burn all the blue conifer bits. Oh well, it plays better with three players anyway. <laughs> All right, folks, we're going to make this a contest, right? And the winner of this contest will win a $50 gift certificate to Cool Stuff. So you just have to tell me which one you like better. Um, so email us at dicetowercontest at gmail.com uh, and say Twitch as the subject line if you like the Twitch one better or say in-laws if you like that one better. How do you we'll spell in-laws? Okay, good point. Uh, we'll say soggy for the second one then since he had a soggy finger. Okay, twitch or soggy. Right. So put those down and send it to dicetowercontest at gmail.com. If you send it to dicetower at gmail.com, it's automatically deleted. All right, you got to send it to the right one. And on our next show, we'll announce the winner for that. Also, if you send us a tale of horror, tale of amazement, tale of whatever, you will get an additional two entries. Why? Why? Because we're we're out of out of the tales that <laughs> I know, and some of you are like, you haven't said mine yet. Yeah, it just didn't reach the heights that I wanted to. Some some we don't do because they're very similar to other ones that have been done. Right. Some are like tales for you were amazing. You're like, I can't believe we were here and, and we were about to die, and then we won. But that doesn't sound as amazing to someone who's not wasn't involved in that game. <laughs> Or yep. whatever, you know. So I, it's it's totally my criteria, and I apologize about that. But we need some new ones, so those will get more entries. And we also need more questions sent to us at dicetower at gmail dot com because we like answering questions. Speaking of which, Tom, Tom, Tom. Uh, yeah, Tom. Tom. Hi, Tom. Tom. How many meeples tall are you? How many game pieces have you broken with that gavel you use? If you could eat at a restaurant based on any game, what would it be? And now, the Dice Tower will authoritatively, definitely, possibly, maybe, answer your questions. Oh, Tom, which way to the game library? Andy says um, he wants to thank us. He gives a nice thanking, so I appreciate that. 
He says he wants to know why PAX Unplugged, when we talk about it, we just call it PAX Unplugged. We don't call it Philadelphia. We don't call BGG Con Dallas. We don't call Dice Tower Con Orlando. And we don't call Gen Con Indianapolis or UK Games Expo Birmingham. So why do we call Spiel Essen? Hmm. And he says, not just a dice tower, it's the whole industry. <laughs> and that's that's true. It really is. Now, whenever someone says the spiel, yes. in my mind, I always think, you're a little snooty. <laughs> I, I, I shouldn't think that, right? But I'm like, yes, I know it's called the spiel. But And you know what? The funny thing is, it's only Americans who do this, as far as I can tell. Maybe Maybe English-speaking people. But if you talk to the Germans and all that, they call it the spiel. Yes. They call it the spiel, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Um, the actual title is not just Spiel, though. It's like International Spieltage at Essen or something. Isn't that right? I'm looking it up. It's it's not just. I mean, Spiel is the is the uh, shortened well, okay, colloquial so version. On, on Wikipedia, which and, we all know to be accurate, <laughs> it starts out by saying <laughs> the international. Spiel tag Spiel. That's I think that's the whole name of it. Often called the Essen Game Fair after mm. the city in which it's held. Blah 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 blah. It's called Spiel for right. short, which is kind of weird because that just means game, which is kind of a right. weird thing. And I, I, I guess you're right. We probably. I, if you go to their website and look at their website. Yes, it is correct, but it's been called Essen for so long. I, I think because, at least from our perspective here in the U.S., it's so much more of a destination con. Like, you have to travel. You have to go to Essen to to visit Spiel. Um, where, I mean, you have to go to Indianapolis to visit Gen Con. I, I don't know why the name hasn't transcended the town, but it's always been Essen as far as I have known. You're you're correct. I don't know what else to say. So yes, and you know what? We could make a, a, an agreement to call it the spiel, and we'd probably end up calling it Essen anyway. So sorry. The good news <laughs> is you know where it is. Yeah, yeah. Games from there are always called Essen games as opposed to spiel games. Because if you just called them spiel games, well, that would, they, that would be game games. Maybe that's the. Maybe it's just a bad name. Ah. Uh, that's the opinion that Eric. I'm not going to call the uh, this big fair that I enjoy going to a bad name. You notice that I put a question mark at the end. I, I was not stating that. I was merely <laughs> putting it out. The mere there. suggestion, sir. Let's go to the next question. <laughs> All right. Jordan says you've mentioned that you won't include escape room games in your favorite games list, etc. How would you say you view these games differently than time stories and otherwise consumable experience that generally won't be revisited? Why not view the exit or unlock games as the system, like the Time Stories modules? This is the way I view it. Um, I don't. I think. Did you declare that you would not put escape room games on your list? I, I know that was a listener that really wanted that. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it because there's so many escape room games coming out, and I like them all so much. But I don't know where to put them in place of a game, and it just. I, I just can't do it. They don't necessarily feel like games. They're a joint experience. Any more than me and my friends going to an escape room, I wouldn't put that on the list either. And just because it comes in a box. Now you say Time Stories. Yeah, that, 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 that's a very similar thing because Time Stories is essentially a big escape room type game. I just drew the line yeah. there. I don't know how else they say it. Uh, <laughs> Vassal has decreed it. No, that's <laughs> – that's not egotistical. <laughs> no, but really, I have to make these lines all the time. Is darts a board game? Is lawn bowling a board game? Right. Is is yeah. Crokinole a board game? You know, so sometimes we just have to make these yeah. calls. And for me, and I'm not, like, accusing anyone else. Well, maybe I do, but it's always in jest. You know, like, oh, you put that in your thing. But for me, I don't want to have my top 100 games and have, like, 30 of them be various versions of escape room games because that's what would happen eventually. I like them that much. They're really fun, but it almost feels like a different right. hobby than board gaming. Yeah, yeah. I mean, last time I did my top 100, I did have a couple on the list, um, but I can see that happening. I, I love them so much that I, I could see them outranking as an experience 
outranking other traditional board games and pushing some of them off the list. And that I guess Wait, that's the danger. I mean, do we do them as a whole series? Do I say exit the games? And because some of them I like a lot more than others. Right? Like I, we just talked about this on Dice Tower tonight. You know, I talked about the three new unlocks. Yeah. One of them I wasn't really that big of a fan of, but the other one I thought was amazing. So where do I rank unlock? It's really hard for me. And so I could just pick certain scenarios. But if I do that, there's like – then literally I would have a quarter to a third of my top 100 would be these escape room scenarios. Yeah. I think we talked about that actually here on this program. No, no. Oh, did we? But I can see how you've been confused. Yeah, I think so. Huh. Yeah. Well, that was yeah. at night, and it was on the Dice Tower. That's what I meant. Yeah, it was It was Dice Tower on right. a night. So Zach says he likes legacy games. And so he bought Risk Legacy, Pandemic Seasons 1 and 2, Seafall, and Gloomhaven, and considering purchasing Charterstone. <laughs> Whoa there, Nelly. Slow down, buddy. <laughs> Don't do that. Just get one and play it. Um, anyway... Uh, he wants to play these games, worried about getting the right group together to play each game. His wife and I love Pandemic. His wife and him, sorry, love Pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> but the, will the game be as full with two people, or should he wait to get the full group of four? Tom likes to play Gloomhaven Solo, but am I missing out? Blah, 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 blah. Oh, my goodness. Don't yeah. do this to yourself. You will just be in misery. Pick a group of players for each game, except Seafall. Don't play that with five at all. Ever. Four, maybe. I would recommend three. But for the rest, Pandemic's easy, okay. two through four. Um, Risk Legacy, uh, I would probably play with four. Yeah, you want to have a few people on there. Two, I think, would be weird. Yeah, Charterstone, Gloomhaven, whatever. You can play with whatever number of players you want. I, I mean, really, just pick a group. Don't... Don't worry so much about it. If you do, you'll never – I mean, the, you just mentioned all these icy games. You're talking months and months, maybe a year of gaming alone there. Just just play yeah, these. Yeah, yeah. I, I wouldn't worry so much about the whole thing. Yep. And, and if you really want to do, play each one with a different number of people. Pick one to play solo. Pick one to play with just you and your wife. Pick one to play with a larger group. It doesn't really matter. Mike uh, is is referencing Best of Essen 2017 episode. Uh, there was a question by someone regarding other games with turn order selection like Viticulture. A few other examples could be Fresco, Pergamon, and Rhodes. But Mike is wondering if there's an official name for this mechanic. It's not really searchable on Board Game Geek. I love this mechanic, says Mike. We could call it turn order selection, or what I call it is choose wake up time, which is what it's called in Fresco, I think, officially. Do you know of the official name, if any, for this mechanism? To clarify this, Mike, there's no official name for any of this stuff. <laughs> when we say <laughs> things like worker placement, that just kind of morphs into being. There's not, it's not officially called worker placement uh, or whatever we call these mechanisms. I, I'm not even sure the Rondell. Is it called the Rondell in all the games? I, at least in the Matt Gertz one, it is. Those are Rondells. Okay, well, whatever. I mean, I don't think... I'm not even sure, like, Dominion ever calls itself a deck-building game, does it? But it doesn't matter. Right. I, I, there's no, I, so there's no official name. But I will agree with you, Mike. I also love this mechanism a lot. I like the idea of choosing to go first but getting less stuff and choosing to go la- later and getting worse, more stuff. Uh, I mm-hmm. think it's a really cool mechanism. All right. Shirayra has asked some questions here, and I'm really interested to uh, – talk about this this is only half of her thing here but she was talking about is there etiquette to demoing a game in a convention and i thought this was like super fascinating so i want to take a moment to talk about this like what's the appropriate length of time to demo a game if a so there's she has four questions so here this is question one so if a complete game takes 45 minutes to an hour should you be considerate and conclude it when you get the gist and the feel of the game to give others a chance to demo it too I already know what Eric's going to say. <laughs> He's going to say, it depends what convention you're at. Uh, y- yeah. Yeah, it does. Well, I mean, I, I would go totally off the lead of whoever's demoing the game. You know, if if the, the folks running it at the convention you're at are, are running a full game, go ahead, play the full game. Uh, if they're only running three turns and then saying, thank you, goodbye, then respect that. That's the way they want to do that and move on. 
I would ask myself before you start the game. And I always, sure. I always tell people myself, like, oh, you want me to d- demo this game? I only got such and such a length of time, you know. Mm-hmm. And they'll say, oh, yeah, no problem. We'll just play a few rounds. Or, you know, I I usually prefer not to demo the whole game unless we're in some – not at a booth anyway. But some people do. Unless, of course, the game's like 15 minutes or 10 minutes. Those, right. sure, I'll play the whole game. Who cares? I'm willing to go up to an hour, I think, in a, in a demo game. But – Anything more than that, and I, I feel like I'm really taking up a lot of time in the booth, and you know. But just as a heads up, at Essen, people will play through whole games, and it's not considered rude at all. At most other conventions, especially American-based ones, that doesn't happen nearly as often. Although I think more and more companies at Essen are are switching to the more North American demo model, where they're only going to run a few rounds and and move on and and doing. A lot more turnover at the tables. It's a more efficient way to do things. If you're if you're at a sales convention, they've paid for this table space. They want as many people as possible to experience the game. It just makes sense to run more people through the game. If you you've got a two hour game and you're running an entire two hour game every single time somebody sits down, you're only showing the game what four times in the course of the eight hour day. That's not very efficient. Yep. 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 So then the second question is, is it rude to get out in the middle of a demoed game, especially if you're playing with strangers? That's definitely a let them know first sort of thing. Um, uh, it, that's that, like you said, you should ask, are we playing the full game? Are we only playing a couple rounds? I only have 30 minutes. Only only have 45 minutes. I need to leave after this yeah, point. But what if you're not enjoying and it? Okay, that has nothing to do with time. If you're not enjoying it. Um, it, I mean, it, it it could certainly be considered rude, but I think if you if you say, hey, um, I think I've seen enough here. Uh, if if you guys want to finish out the round, I I'm happy moving on to something else, and you know at least get a little bit of agreement from the rest of the table. But yeah, I I think it's I think it's okay. Everyone's busy, and there's plenty of things to see at a convention. It's not as rude as it would be if you were at game night and just suddenly went, you know what, I'm not feeling this. I'm going to go home. It's doable. I think so. Eric is correct. All right, number three. If there's two or three or four of you, should you be considered and take one or two spots only? The non-playing member of your group can be a shadow player playing in tandem with you. I think this would be a good compromise since they learn the rules this way and follow the gameplay even if they're not playing directly. I would only do this if there was some sort of, like, direct conflict with another group that wanted to play. I, I think if you're there with four people, sit down and play a four-player yeah, game. Yeah, you yeah. just mentioned that, you know, quitting a game with strangers, play games with someone you like then, and you won't run into that problem. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. Then then it's very easy to say, you know what, guys, I'm not liking this. And then, you, okay, fine, let's go. Um, if if all four of you are waiting, you all get to play the game. It's It's not... There's almost not enough room to have somebody standing around behind another player. There aren't enough chairs for everyone to sit. It's, yeah, take the seat, play also, the game. Also, the other players Unless... might find that kind of annoying. To play against <laughs> yeah, Eric true. and his wife and his friend. Like, what, there's three people playing that position? Hmm. Yeah, yeah. And now this one I do like. This is a good one. How do you wait in line? Next to the table you're hoping to demo next, or is it first time, first served bases? I think that depends on the way they've got things set up. I, I tend to hover, um, and and I might even try and figure out which table is ending first. You know, it, what, where where are you guys, and uh, you know, how much longer do you think you have? And you may be able to figure out which table is going to end earliest. Maybe flagging down the person that's running the game and asking which table they think is going to finish first. Um, it Usually by the time you get to the end of the game, in the second half or so, the person that's actually demoing it won't be in- intervening very much. They don't have to guide as much. So they can sort of look around and chat and let you know which table is going to end. And then they know you're waiting and can maybe flag you down when one table is, is finishing up. The problem is when you have three or four groups that all want to be next. And I don't know what the best answer for that is. Then you, you really should um, 
talk to the person so that they know who is waiting and they know who is next at their table. Hmm. Yeah, the, when we were at PAX, they had a line at the different booths hmm. to wait for the next hmm. demo. But I don't see that very often. Normally, it's you got to be in the right place at the right time. Yeah, it really is a – you see people standing up and you pounce. It's, at, at it's Aston, hard. Actually, and I, and that's, I, that, that's an unusual thing. I'm sorry. <clears throat> at the spiel, um, <laughs> I see people – that when people run in sometimes at the beginning of the fair, it's not to buy games. It's to get a seat at some of these tables. It's true. Some are very hard to get. Uh, CGE is traditionally packed the whole time, and they're one of the companies that's moved toward – the, doing the shorter demos because they need more turnover. They they just had all the tables full constantly. Yeah, well, all right. Well, that's that. So then she has some other ideas about this, but we'll discuss them in a future episode. Send us more questions at okay. Dicetower at gmail.com. Folks, thanks for the questions we've got so far. And now to go back in time. It's a Dice Tower Top Ten! The Dice Tower's Top Ten list is sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc. Cool Stuff, Inc. Cool Stuff in stock at CoolStuffInc.com. Wow, 15 years ago. Now, I don't oh my goodness. think it's kind of weird because we've talked about, uh, I remember distinctly uh, last time we talked, or... No, it's going to be next year. Next year when we do this, we're going to be like, 2004 was amazing. Yeah. 2003 wasn't quite there. It no, had some but, great yeah. games for sure. I recall in 2003, that was back, that was back before um, we had simultaneous production of these, of these various games. So games would come out at Spiel um, in Essen, and you wouldn't see them for months. And so our game group would would scour those Essen lists and order from one of the German companies, have it shipped over. And and a lot of these things would be sight unseen or based on a couple of pictures uh, that we got from various Essen reports. And um, and we'd get this crate full of games and, and we'd have to play through them. And, and the hit rate was not fantastic. You know, often we'd, we'd have paid to ship these things over and these games turned out not to be so great. Um but this was certainly the era of that sort of thing happening. It was it was a, a different time for sure. Yeah, and it's really interesting here as I'm going through. I'm looking ahead at our list because I'm cheating, and we don't have a lot of crossover. There is not a lot of crossover. I find it I find it very interesting actually how this is all panning. Well, out. several games on Eric's list um, were on my short list. Mm-hmm. Not all of them. Want to be clear I know. about that? I know, and 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 with the fifteen year list, we've had some of these arguments at least once before. Well, there's nothing good like dredging up that thing. You never did like that game from two thousand three. <laughs> that's that's how all relationships work. Bring back history. I think yes. that's what I learned. Dredge to it make all a back relation up. is to dredge up things from the past that strengthens yes. a relationship. I believe. I think yes. That was let's, well, definitely let's, mentioned, I think. Let's get right to it, then. Number 10. Number 10 is Santiago. Uh, this is a negotiation game that can be very, very mean. Uh, you're trying to grow various crops. You, you bid on these tiles. Uh, and, but then somebody gets to be the water manager and decide what fields are going to get watered that round. And you can bribe them and you can, you know, try and coerce them and come up with an alliance with them, but they're going to put the water where they're going to put the water. And uh, you can you can get your field that you just paid for totally droughted out, and it can be very mean. Um, Santiago is, is a, an interesting system. There are a few games like it. Number 10. So I'm looking at Eric's list from that he made years ago, and this was not on your list, Eric. No, it, I guess it's... Uh, the I soured on it because it's so mean. Probably around then, and I've I've sort of worked its way back up. I'm I'm willing to accept that it is a quality and well built system. All right, I accept your 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 apology, but I <laughs> I also like it. Although, did not make my list. My number ten is, uh, well, Die Sieben Segal. 
Deceben we- Siegel. Yes. <laughs> Actually, when I talk- we talked about this five years ago, I called it Zing. And nowadays, if you're looking for a copy of this game, it's Slough Off. Hmm. This is a trick-taking game. I like trick-taking games, and I like simple ones with a twist. This one is actually slightly more complex. It's not complex to play, but at the beginning of the game, you are – or beginning of each uh, hand, you are betting on how many tricks you'll take of each color. Mm -hmm. But like, I'll take two blue tricks and a red trick. And then one person's like, I'm going to try to ruin everyone else's guesses. (laughs) That that person's the traitor or what have you. Yep. I like it. It's a lot of fun. It's simple. It's easy. There's other games that have come out since that have also done this one. This one has dropped slightly for me. Uh, when I made this list back in 2005, it wasn't mentioned. I must not have played it yet. But it went from 8 to 10. But I still really like it. The, the Seven Seals or Slough Off or Zing. Yeah, I, uh, this was shortlisted for me. This is one of those games that we did order from Germany when it came out, and, and it was a success. Uh, so this is probably 11 or 12. Good game. Number nine. Next up for me is Coloretto, uh, which is the, the simpler card game system that then later became Zularetto. Uh, you're, you're simply drafting these color cards, and your first three are going to score you positive points, but anything you take after that is negative, and you are trying to create sets of these and offering them to your your opponents, um, adding to them or or grabbing those sets and trying to get the most beneficial set for you. That never happens, though. You always end up taking stuff you don't want. It's it's a, a lovely portable version of the system that that many people know as Zularetto, but Coloretto is is also a quality game. Number nine. Huh. This one was not on your list last year, Eric, or last time we did this, five years ago. Five years ago. But it was on mine at number 10. Ah, well, there you go. It wasn't on my list in 2003, though, but maybe I hadn't played it yet. I like Coloretto a lot, but frankly, if I'm going to play Coloretto, I'm just going to play Zularetto, Ah. which takes the same thing and turns it into a board game. Yes. So, all right, my number nine is Smarty Party, which is a game that initially I said was okay. And now it's a game that I go to R&R Games and I say, please remake Smarty Party with modern questions, if possible. Hmm. Okay. Smarty Party is the ultimate top ten list of games to some degree. You'll be like, well, not top ten, but you'll be like, list, you know, countries that border Russia or list drinks that Coca-Cola makes or whatever. And you just go around the table and each person lists one. But you have to say one that's on the paper or on the, this little chart and one person's checking it off. If you can't say one that someone else hasn't already said, then you will take a point and you don't want points. So once all the point chips are gone, you start the next round. Hmm. Uh, but if every time you get it correct, you get to grab the little rubber pants and you, because you're <laughs> the smarty pants. Right. And that will actually make you lose a point. This is a really fun party game, and I kept it for years because it was that entertaining. Some of the questions, um, considering it came out 15 years ago, so some of the questions are a little dated at this point, especially if, you know, geography has changed. You might talk about a TV show, and people are like, uh, my parents watch that? <laughs> you know, so th- that's, you know, I'm hoping they do some a redone version of this at some point, but I really liked Smarty Party. Hmm. Number eight. All right, my number eight, I'm almost positive, was on my list five years ago, and that is Rumus, which is now known as Blockus 3D. The, it was the actually Blockus number company. four on your list. There you go. Uh, Rumus is is uh, where you're placing these three-dimensional polyominoes, uh, these, these cube-based structures, uh, on a board, and um, eventually you're trying to score points by being visible from above. You look down at the at the board, and, and if you can see your color, that's a point for you. Uh, but you also have to deal with height restrictions and uh, and various special rules based on the board you're playing. It comes with a turntable. I was really disappointed that the expansion, Rumus Plus, was never widely available. Um, and, and so I was always sort of bummed that Blockus bought it so that that expansion sort of never came out. But still, the base game, very strong. My number eight, Rumus. I'm looking at three different lists here, and like I'm about to say the wrong number eight. My number eight was number two in 2003, or actually it was number two, yeah, in 2003, and then it last time we did this five years ago wasn't even no, it was number seven. So I guess it's dropping, and that's Return right. of the Heroes. 
Yeah, I don't know that I'd play this game that much these days because there's so many other adventuring games. Return of the Heroes was the first, like, adventuring game that kind of had a Euro vibe to it. You took these heroes and you went out around and did essentially pick up and deliver things, which is why I'm always surprised Eric doesn't like this game. Hmm. I haven't played this one. But that's really what it is. You're, like, getting stats and you fight monsters occasionally, but it's mostly, like, go here, pick that up. Go over there, deliver it. Deliver a message to the king. Go pick up this fruit, take it to the witch, or whatever. Mm -hmm. Has some really bright artwork, which is a little dated now that I'm looking at it. Um, But I did enjoy this one a lot, especially with the expansion that came out a year or two later. Return of the Heroes. Now, just just to clarify, we are, you're looking at two different past lists. There's one list that we did five years ago when this was a 10-year look back. And then you went all the way back to what was it? Episode 19 of the podcast yeah, is the original true. list that's, from 2005. That's a lot of episodes ago. Yeah. Uh, so just just we talked about this off air and I, I don't think we actually said it while we were recording. Number seven. My number seven has, has been reprinted many times with a whole bunch of different publishers and in various new versions. It, this has had a, a, a nice long tail and that is Hey That's My Fish, the game about the penguins trying to cordon off sections of ice flows and pick up fish for themselves uh, and, and not let the other penguins in it's it's a a lovely little abstract that works well with families but has some depth to it and some real strategy going on uh i i love it and and this is one i don't think i've played with the kids no i have i've played this my son won it at origins and we instantly brought it out and he enjoyed it yes hey that's my fish number seven all right and hey that my fish is a very popular one i like it i just think a lot of their games have done it better I wonder if it was on my list in 2003, though. It wasn't. All right, great. Um, My number seven is higher on Eric's list. It's one of the few crossovers we have, but he did his list in alphabetical order. Ha! You did, practically. (laughs) That's true. Number six. Number six is still one of my favorites. It's a sentimental favorite. Fearsome Floors, a Freedom and Freeze game about running from a monster, sliding on blood pools, pushing blocks around, and and trying to avoid this thing uh, that it, you know is going to go for your friends. Um, you got these reversible discs. You can move, you know, maybe two spaces one round and then five spaces the next round. And you're trying to flee out of this, this catacomb thing. Uh, I, I love it. Fearsome Floors, which was Finister Fluor or something like that in German. My number six. My number... Six, well, by the way, that was Eric's number three five years ago. Ah. My number six is a tie because they're essentially the same game, is 10 Days in Africa or 10 Days in the USA. Now, I think, was it on Dice Tower tonight where we were talking about a speed racco thing? Uh, I, I think, yeah, we just talked about it uh, on last week's. It was um, the, the, the other Freedom and Freeze game finished where you're playing racco. Yeah, no. No, that's not interesting to me, but even though <laughs> I'm not a huge fan of Racco, 10 Days in the USA or 10 Days in Africa, by the way, this was number nine. This one's actually moved up for me, just really works. Uh, it's There's several games in this series, but just the idea of mixing geography and building a path of 10 tiles, showing how you cross them by taking them and switching them and moving them around – it's a really good casual game. I've had such great success with people who don't normally play games teaching this one. And I think I like Africa a little bit better than the USA, if only because I don't know it as well. Hmm. So that's kind of interesting to me. That's just kind of a cool little map to work on. Yeah. But a lot of fun. A great series uh, from the the now defunct duo of Alan Moon and Aaron Weisblum, both still making games. But this they, they used to work together, and this was one of the results. Yeah, it's a it, – I mean the the connection to Racco is pretty apt. It's a terrific gateway game because many people – most people know Racco. And you can say, oh, you know that one? How about this one that has a, a significant more strategy to it? Um, it? It is a really great game to introduce to just about everybody. Number five. My number five begins, yeah, the alphabetical section of my list. Uh, it is a, a very small footprint pickup and deliver game called Atta Ants. You're trying to get leaves back to your ant hill and spawn more ants. And if you manage to get all of your ants on the board at once, you win. But there are spiders and the spiders will eat you. So don't do that. My number five, Atta Ants. This must be one that you have played recently. This was not on your list five years ago. 
Really? That's that seems very strange to me. Because well, I, I, I no, I no, got this no, one. No, 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 no. That's super weird. But maybe super you played weird. it like four and a half years ago. I, I know I played it well before. I know this is one that I ordered um, as soon as I heard about it. I saw this in the, on the Essen list and and made made the effort to get it. Huh. I don't know. I don't know. What to tell you. All right. My number five was number two for me last time, and in two thousand three, didn't make my list because I had it played it at that point. And that's Faces. Faces is picture apple to apple essentially. Uh, but using hilarious old timey wimey faces, especially the ladies, for whatever reason, there's these old, mean looking ladies, <laughs> and it's so much fun to say which one of them is secretly, you know, a murderer, which one of them is, you know, in love with you or whatever. Uh, yeah. it's really funny. It's a hilarious game. I love playing this one. That's faces. Yes. I mean, I, I like it better with your custom set, but it is, it is a lot of fun. This is definitely one that's great for conventions to, to draw a crowd with. Number four. Number four was on Tom's list as well in the number seven position. That is Alhambra, the um, Spiel des Jahres winner, I think, for this year. And uh, it, it's, I got the chance to play this somewhat recently and, and was reminded of how, how good a game it is. It's, it's got some real layers. It's a... Um, an, a majority game, you know, it's a, a sort of a, yeah, it's an area majority game as you, as you try and collect more of a particular type of tile than other players, uh, maybe going for second place to earn some of those points. And it's also a tile laying game uh, as you try and position those, those valuable tiles so that you can actually walk around your village. Um, neat, I think, I think well deserving of its, of its Spiel des Jahres. Alhambra, number four. Yes, and I like Alhambra too. It's just a game that, for some reason, it's one of those games that when you play it, you're like, that's a pretty good game. Ah, oh, there's probably better games out there. Mm-hmm. And then here we are 15 years later still talking about it. It's a solid addition. Now, having 25 mini expansions doesn't hurt it, for sure. My number four is Yinch. Yinch was my number six uh, five years ago, and in 2003 I still hadn't played it. Back in 2003... I was not playing most of the games that came out in any given year. <laughs> just, <laughs> yeah, we yeah. weren't. I wasn't as on the ball at that point in time. But I still. This is such a great abstract game. Get five in a row. I've always liked games like that. And this one, you're sliding rings around on the board, blocking rings, and when you ju- move over pieces, you flip them over to your color. So it's kind of a mix between a five in a row game and what's the game where you flip pieces over? Othello. Othello. Yeah. It's kind of a mix between those with beautiful, gorgeous pieces. Chris Berm, who made this game, is still making games in this series. A new one came out in 2017. Hmm. So 15 years ago, he made Yinch, which I still think is the best of the lot. Um, It's obviously very subjective, but I like it a lot. My number four, (laughs) Yinch. That's Y-I-N-S-H. Number three. My number three is one of Tom and Mai's old arguments. uh, No, I like this game. Uh, Really? No, it's a lie. It's awful. Yeah. No, you really don't like this one. Uh, Attica, you're trying to get all of your buildings out on the board using resources that are both on the board and on cards to do so, but also taking advantage of of chains that can give you free buildings. Uh, And it's also, there's an alternate victory, which is what Tom hates, is if you connect different points of the board and you can win that way, and it's an instant win that the other players need to watch out for. Um, I like that dual thing. Tom does not. But I, I also love the race and the efficiency engine of trying to get all your buildings out. I, it's, it's, a, it's a neat race. Attica, number three. <sighs> all right. Well, this, Eric has been consistent about this one, at least. It was actually his number two, so it's obviously dropped for him a little bit, and that's good. <laughs> My number three is Domain. Domain, what a fantastic game from Klaus Teuber. It was my number three five years ago. And it was my number three back in 2005. So I'm very consistent with this one. (laughs) This is a great, mean game. As you place walls and gain little kingdoms, and you're trying to expand your kingdoms, and you cut each other off, and you're pushing into each other and going back and forth. A neat card system where you pay to play a card, or if you don't have a card, you discard a card for money, but then someone else can take that card and use it against you. Really, really great game, Domain. All right, so 
when Domain came out, it, it is a distilled, uh, revamped version of Lowenhertz uh, by the same designer. And I was on the Lowenhertz side of things, saying, no, no, I like Lowenhertz better. I like this better. I refuse to accept that Domain may be a better system. I'm, You know what? This is all cooled. Lowenhertz is no longer in my collection. I'm willing to accept that Domain might be a good game. <laughs> Which is funny because Lowenhertz was meaner than Domain. Oh, it Domain's definitely was. a mean was. game, but lower is a meaner. I can't imagine why you would like the meaner game better. I don't know. I, there was something about it. I only played Domain once, and I said, I oh, no, no. I like back then. I, I, I think I felt it was dumb, dumbed down or something. Maybe I, I don't know what. I'm willing to try it again, but I'm not in a giant rush to do so. But I, I'd willi- be willing to, to go for it and I'm accept that marathon. maybe Domain is better. <laughs> ah, great. Number two. Number two is Amun Ray, uh, the, the Reiner Knizia classic. We've discussed it many times. To- oh, wait, would you look at that? Our synergy, after two lists that have almost nothing to do with each other, Tom and I have both chosen Amun yeah, Ray. This, my Amun Ray for me was number four uh, five years ago. It was number four for me in 2005. Mm. And it was number six for you, so it's moved up for you. I mean, it's moved up yeah. for me, too. Have you played the new version? I have not played the new version. I'm still on the the, the classic. Well, it's the same uh, original thing. edition. Nice components is basically it, but it's back. It's out now again. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a really solid game, and it has a lot of facets, and uh, it it has a lot to do with the the play styles of the people around you. There's there's a lot of dynamics based entirely on what your opponents do in this game. It's it's a really solid, intricate system. I agree. This is a fantastic game. It's held up really well for 15 years. Again, that it was just reprinted. Um, it's a game where uh, my, I always say this when I talk about it. One of the things I like is that halfway through the game, you wipe everything you own off the board, but the mm. stuff you built remains. Yeah, and, and you change you the value of everything. Again. So Eric might have spent the first half of this game uh, you know, building up this cool pyramid thing, and now I'm going to take that away from him. Right, it's but you're going to pay now. for it. Yeah, it's interesting. So Amon Ray, great game, and of course, always worth mentioning that one of Eric's uh, game group people has written one of the best session reports on this in the history of humanity. It's true. Well, that was a, that was a moment of us being together on the same page. Let's banish that moment. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's split that up. Let's end that real fast. And finally, number one. Number one is the pure pick-up-and-deliver game Logistico. This is another one that we ordered from Germany, we were super excited about, and my game group, for some reason, has some of the highest reviews of this game on group Board thing. Game Geek, or at least we did. Uh, it, it's thing. really weird. Like All the high rankings were like, yeah, th- this is a great game, and it was our game group. Very weird. Anyway, Logistico, pick up and deliver. You're taking cubes and putting them down on discs and using your boat and your plane and your uh, truck to do so. I love the efficiency engine, and it's it's fun. It's a blast. Logistico, number one. I, I cannot emphasize how much I hate this game. Mm. Like, it's a two for me. <laughs> I, oh, don't, I, I don't get I, I can understand not loving it, but a two? Ah, oh, I hate it. It's p- everything I hate about pickup and delivery. You have to like work in this game to get any points at all. You can sell your vehicles that you're using to transport the stuff to get some points because that's how much your game is sucking at that point in time. <laughs> I've never seen I'm a done game with do this. that. You're like, oh, you know what? I'm just going to sell one of my playing pieces. I can't get any more points with that. <laughs> yeah. You can't sell your plane, though. You can sell your truck and your boat, but not you your plane. You can score negative points in this game. That's if you're terrible. And you get insulted by people who like the game. <laughs> they say What's your play is terrible. I haven't got negative points, but I'm just saying that it feels like you're trying to get out of this rut in this game. The one good thing I'll say about Logistico is I like the cube colors. They were all kinds of cut different weird colors. They yep, were not yep, your yep. red, blue, and green. It's one of the first games that did that, and I was like... Wow, that's a cool concept. You're saying that the cubes of the resources you're delivering don't have to be the same cubes as the player colors. Yeah. And yet companies are still doing this today. Uh-huh. How yeah, they use all the paint. To... <sighs> yes. 
It, yes. I, my, 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 my eyes twitching. That just bugs me. <laughs> I, I'm, I, where's my hammer? Okay. All right. Tell me the theme of your game, Tom. The theme of my game is in the future, there is a giant alien that's hidden in the North Pole somewhere. And this alien finds out that a massive threat is coming to Earth to destroy Earth. So they want to fight back. But this alien, even though they have the power to fight back, knows nothing about tactics or strategy or war. So they build a virtual arena and go through Earth's history, finding the greatest heroes, even though apparently some of these people never existed. They're picking people from mythology, but whatever. They put them in this arena and they are watching them fight each other to see so that they can learn to fight off this incoming alien menace. That big giant alien and that incoming menace have nothing to do with the game. (laughs) It is just a cover so we can talk about why heroes from out time and history are fighting each other. You control a group of heroes from people from the West, Kit Carson, Annie Oakley, to Robin Hood, to some, you know, one of Charlemagne's knights, to Napoleon, to future Venya robot, weird aliens, and you just go fight. This is a game that is not for everybody. Uh, in fact, it's not for many people, actually. But it's, oh, I love the theme. The variety in this game. I, I, I remember in 2003, specifically, I was looking on the internet, and it said 2 to 16 players. And I was like, what? <laughs> There's a game that goes to 16 players? And then you could buy it and seven expansions. Now, this was pre-Kickstarter. So <laughs> the idea of getting a metric ton of content for a game just blew my mind. Mm-hmm. I was like, you can get that much stuff for one game? Now it would be like, mm, that's a bad sign. <laughs> but at that time, I was like, oh, that's amazing. So I got it, and I loved it. I still love it. The second edition came out uh, several years ago, um, and I, you know, I, I replaced the first edition. But I, I, this game, I'm not going to pretend that it's a game everyone's going to like. There's a lot of luck in it. There's also a lot of strategy. There's a lot more rules than there needs to be. It's a little fiddly. It's not the best components in the world. But the theme and the fun of it is still something I enjoy a lot. That's Duel of Ages. Did I even mention the name? I don't I, – I'm not sure you did. Um, I mean so you've mentioned sorry, it before. Everyone. Eric asked me about the theme and that threw me off. Yeah. So, you know, the, the story I have to tell, I think I probably mentioned it, is is somewhere around 2005 I was listening to this podcast and and this guy was just raving about this game and how amazing it was and – uh, so I, I took an opportunity to trade for a copy. I got the the set one world spanner and um, you know read through the rules and 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 looked at all the pieces, sorted everything, and and then I I traded it away um, without ever playing it because I just couldn't make heads or tails of the theme and um, no one wanted to play it with me. No, that's fair enough. I mean, except I mean, you should have played it, but whatever, you know. At, nowadays, you, I, I bet. Let's say the same thing happened. I bet you could get like your son to play it with you. You would have tried it once with him. Maybe. I mean, it was just one of those that that I just never was going to get to. But I'm glad you like it. I am, and again, I'm not pushing it as much as I pushed it back then. It was number one then. It was number one five years ago. I am nothing but consistent in that regard. But let's see if the people's choice is consistent. All right. So they're number 10. Wait, why did I have these? Okay, I need to... That's from last week. Yeah, don't worry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. That's from last... Number 10 was Amon Ray for the people. Last time, it was number four. So it's falling off the radar a bit, which is kind of weird considering it still has... It just came out with a new edition. Right, yeah. Number nine is Fearsome Floors, which was number six last time. That one's not in print, so that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Number eight is Dancing Eggs, which I would like to point out was Eric's number seven last time. Yeah, I considered this one again. I mean, it's it's a terrific kids game. It's still in print. It's it's a good bit of fun. It it it's gets kids running around the table like maniacs. It's it's a good game. I like it too, and I considered it, but I said, you know, it's a, such a one note, one moment game. It and is. We don't pull it out that often. It's true. Okay, so then number seven for people was Domain, which was their number eight last year, and that's good. Number six is the big one that a lot of people are probably screaming I didn't mention at all, and that's Game of Thrones. I like Game of Thrones, 
and it was your number it was the people's choice number two last time mm. i like game of thrones it is a fantastic game it's just not for me anymore it's i like games where you stab people in the back and are mean to them i really do i'm not sure i want to play those games for four hours it's okay. stressful it's long and i'm kind of played out after two hours i think of something like that <laughs> yeah okay Number five is Carcassonne the Castle, which was People's Choice number seven. And in fact, in 2003, that was on my list. I really did like it, but then they made Carcassonne the City, which just blows it away in every way. Mm, Yeah. The Castle was the Reiner Knizia version of the system, right? It was also only two players. Yes. Uh, The People's Choice number four is Yinch, which was not on the People's... No, it was number nine on the People's Choice last time. Number three, Coloretto. Mm-hmm. which last time was also number three, so that stayed true. Number two, Hey, That's My Fish, which was the People's Choice number one last time. Huh. So their number one now is Alhambra, which was not even on the list last time. Why is that? that Has there been a resurgence sense. of Alhambra? Wow. A few other games that we should mention that fell off both or, or of our lists or People's Choice, uh, Balloon Cup which is a yep, great yep. two-player game. But uh, I think there's a lot of other great two-player games that kind of have superseded it as time has gone by. Gulo Gulo, Gulo was on Eric's list, a great kids game, but I think his kids are probably getting too old for that. A little. I mean, it's it's sort of a one-note thing, too. You're just trying to grab the eggs out. It's, it's, it's a great fun, um, but I just didn't find it very engaging after a while. Eric's biggest drop, the only other one that's not on his list anymore... And he, that's because he probably finally saw the light about how boring this game is. And that's The Bridges of Shangri-La. Uh, yeah, it is on the trade pile. <laughs> I don't know why I'm taking joy in that. I, I shouldn't know. be. <laughs> so let's look at my list from 2005. Back when I, so one was Duel of Ages, two Return of the Heroes, three Domain, four Amon Ray, five Zendo. Mm. Why is, but I think Zendo wasn't on the list for 2003 when I was going through this. Yeah, I don't. I think that... Maybe I there thought it came out that else. year. Who knows? Yeah. All right. Carcass on the Castle. Igloo Pop. That's a fun kids game. Mm-hmm. Well, actually, it's a fun adult game, too. <laughs> Eight, King Me, which was just remade in 2017 as a Super Mario game. Ooh. Nine, Queen's Necklace, which was probably my number 11. And 10, Peace Bowl, which is a really funky little football game, which would not even come close to making my top 10 today. But back then, I was enamored with the silly theme of it. <laughs> Whew. That was a fun trip down memory lane. Well, I'll tell you what. I'm thankful. If there's nothing else about Duel of Ages, it made me write one of my first reviews. It wasn't my first review, but it was one of my first reviews. And people said, wow, I was so enthusiastic. I wrote this super enthusiastic review. And people said, that was a great review. Thanks. It wasn't a great review. I've read it, reread it. And I'm like, well, I don't know. That's horrible. But (laughs) when I read this, I was like, wow, you know, maybe – maybe I should write more reviews and stuff that people seem to enjoy that. So thank you, Duel of Ages. And then I wrote reviews of most of the games both Eric and I talked about. In fact, I'm going to look up my Logistico review right now. Review Tom <laughs> Vassal. Have I reviewed this game? Well, there's an Eric Summer video review of it. There is. What is that all about? That was one of the ones I did last year. Oh, okay. I watched it. It was great. <laughs> Do I sound convincing? <laughs> Okay, yeah, I actually have rated it a 2. And if it helps at all, I rated wow. it a 2 in 2013. So that means in, in 2013, I went and re-va- re-evaluated it. Wow. Oh, I never did review this game. Did I make a comment on it, though? Let, let's see if I, if I made a comment here. I, um, I mean, I, I get not liking it, but but call. I mean, two is like it's barely a game. That doesn't. My comment is: any game in which you can do nothing and possibly win is no fun. The economic system in this game is downright depressing. Who could do nothing and win? That doesn't make any sense. You can get six points by doing nothing. Right. You can't win with six points. If you did nothing and got six points, someone else would destroy you. Someone will deliver those cubes. But it will be more fun, I think. It's more fun to deliver cubes. It's more fun to get the six points and go play a better game. It, oh, my goodness. <laughs> Sometimes, Tom. Hey, did you see Logistical on the People's Choice? 
I didn't I, see it on the People's Choice. I did not because it's out of print. That's the problem. Oh, really? Uh, let me see what else on the People's Choice here. Fearsome <laughs> Floors. Mm-hmm. Out of print. Uh, uh, well, actually, that's probably the only one that's out of print on the People's Choice. But still. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm people gonna... just haven't seen my video review yet. That's that's what it is. You think that's going to change people's minds? <laughs> it's too new. <laughs> okay, I'm no. We're gonna we're gonna like even go farther with this. Okay, so <laughs> <laughs> I will. Let's look at the people's choice. I'm gonna go and see. Uh, I think I have like I usually get stats like for the top twenty five. Wait, really? But... You're you're gonna see if it's on there somewhere? No, I, I I know it's not. I'm gonna list games that people said were better than that. Uh. R Eco. Quicksand from Fantasy Flight. Mystery Rummy Al Capone. Whoa, was that right. one there? That, that, yeah, that I, I, I on my considered okay. that one. Age of Mythology. Battle Ball, the game. Mermaid Rain. Wreckage. Warcraft, the board game. <laughs> oh, okay. I'm sorry. I, 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 I make fun and love. That's not true. I make fun and hate. Yeah, you really don't like this game. <laughs> I like I like I like um, uh, Attica better actually than Logistico, <laughs> but I will only uh, play Attica with two players if I had to play it. All right. Okay. Well, folks, we appreciate you sticking around for this episode. Uh, tune in next week for Mandy and Suzanne, and don't forget Dice Tower tonight, and most especially our Kickstarter. There's only a few days left, so jump in on that if you want to, folks. We again thank you for listening. Without you, we would have no podcast. Until next time, I'm Tom Vassell. I'm Eric Summerer. And you've been listening to The Dice Tower. Thanks for listening. Promotional consideration has been provided by game publishers in the form of review copies of games. This episode, number 540, was recorded on January 25th, 2018. Coming up next week, Mandy and Suze take the helm, and in two weeks, Tom and I will be back with our top 10 monster games. This podcast is sponsored by listeners like you. Thank you for your continued support. And speaking of support, the Jack Vassell Memorial Fund is dedicated to providing support to members of the board gaming community in their hour of need. If a catastrophic event has become more than you can handle, find out how we can help at jackvassell.org. The Dice Tower is produced by Tom, Mandy, Suzanne, and Eric, with assistance from Itai Perez, Derek Porter, and Rob Searing. Our Star Trek action figure set with five copies of Dr. McCoy provided by Too Many Bones. Timothy Pinkham composed our theme, and hosting is provided by Cool Stuff, Inc., where you can find great games at great prices at CoolStuffInc.com. Let us know what you think of the show by posting to the Dice Tower Guild at BoardGameGeek.com, following the Dice Tower on Twitter, or by emailing us at Dicetower at gmail.com. And don't forget to visit the other shows in the Dice Tower network, including Four Corners of the Board, Board Games with Panda, Boards and Swords, On Board Games, The Party Game Cast featuring The Party Game Cast, Board Games Insider, Tabletop Game Talk, and Board Game Blitz. Find out more at Dicetowernetwork.com. Until next time, from all the gang at the Dice Tower, have fun gaming. I'm feeling like very emotionally drained after after this one. This was a very brutal list for me. Do you feel like I? But but I only I only criticize two of your games. Yeah, but they they're heavily criticized. Just listen. Just okay, say. we'll end on a positive note. I like you more than I like Logistico. Thank you.